the recording. But since the, all three of the saints, these great hierarchs and ecumenical teachers, really contributed in in many ways to the growth of the ascetic life of monasticism, Saint Gregory being the of the three, the most reclusive, you know, the one wanting and spending the most time as just kind of living as a monk. Um, we're, we'll start with, even though it's a day later, we'll start with the hymn for the, for the great hierarchs. The three most great luminaries of the three sun divinity have illumined all of the world with the rays of, of doctrines, divine and true. They are the sweetly flowing rivers of wisdom who with godly knowledge have watered all creation in clear and mighty streams, the great and sacred Basil and the theologian wise Gregory, together with the renowned John, the famed Chrysostom of golden speech. Let us all who love their divinely wise words come together honoring them with hymns, for ceaselessly they offer entreaty for us to the Trinity. Amen. Uh, I did have a couple of things that I wanted to share just before we start reading. Stevie, you have a hand up. I'm sorry, Father. I don't know if you can hear it, but there's some background noise coming from somebody else's computer. Um, and it's okay. Quite well, if we could ask them. Oh, I think it's gone. Did, what, that, that ended it? Okay. That ended it. Thank you. All right, good, good. Uh, I um, I apologize, I didn't get to um, scanning and sending these works uh, to you. But before we start reading, I just, I wanted to think, I want us to think about two things. Uh, number one, the, I want to, I want to do two like small readings. And one of them, I think, really um, raises the bar very high and helps us to uh, to appreciate and understand just how serious learning how to pray is and how, how serious we should take it. Um, and that comes from uh, Yerenda Milianos and uh, a, a homily that he gave on prayer. In, the, in in our first session, I, I was going to read some of this, and I never got to it. And I was reminded that I hadn't I hadn't read it. I gave a talk for about an hour on just this this homily of Yanande Emilianos, where I broke down what he what he says about prayer and about praying the Jesus prayer to like ten different kind of steps. But I I um I could share that with people if they would they would like to see it his his whole talk on prayer is very subjective it's not so much an objective approach to prayer it's not so much you know what prayer is as it is how we experience prayer right uh, at the jesus prayer what it what it feels like when we're first beginning to pray compared to what it feels like when um prayers reached its goal which is um to be the prayer of the heart and to where god is present before us, and 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 um, we have gone beyond words. We've gone beyond even the ability to describe um, the experience of of the glory of God. So um, he starts out though with this, and uh, it it can be a little intimidating, but I still decided I want to start with this. And then the other story that I'm going to share is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, an encouragement about just what can really happen if we if we determinedly set ourselves to to say the Jesus prayer every day. So, Yaranda Milinos on prayer. Today we will consider one of the principal aspects of the spiritual life to which we are introduced by the Triodion as a whole, but in particular by this initial period of Lent, namely the subject of prayer. Do we really know what prayer is, and do we know how to pray? From the time we were little children, we learned to say our prayers. But has our prayer life subsequently followed its proper course? Prayer is the journey of the soul toward God, the purpose being to reach him and be united with him. 
If a car or a ship is going the wrong way, it will never reach its destination. If the soul at prayer is not going the right way, you understand that it will never reach God. It would be like being in a boat with the boatmen pulling wrongly on the oars and in the end accomplishing nothing except to go in circles around the same point. The same thing can happen to us without our even knowing it. What we must therefore look at is whether or not our prayer is successful. You know that people who do not know how to pray are in reality good for nothing. There's no chance that they will succeed in life. Even if they are monks, they will remain earthly people and never become heavenly. They will never become angels because they do not know how to read the map or navigate the ship of prayer. As you yourselves feel the harm that befalls us, if we do not know how to pray, is, incal is incalculable. Incalculable. It is the only harm from which we suffer. Now, remember, he's talking to his, um, his uh, spiritual children, you know, uh, 50 or 60 monks in Simonopatra. I don't know when he, when he gave this talk, maybe it was early on. Maybe there weren't quite so monks, and that's all, that's their work, right? But still, so listen to how he he um, puts a little bit of the, of the fear of prayer into their hearts. It is the only harm from which we suffer. There is no catastrophe that can compare with it. If all the stars and all the planets were to collide with one another, and the universe to to shatter into smithereens. The damage would be far less than that which befalls us if we don't know how to pray. It follows then that where there is spiritual ignorance, we are in immediate and definitive danger. Should we take prayer seriously? <laughs> Should we make certain we 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 uh, we learn and enter into this journey of prayer. So the other story now that, that counterbalances, you know, yet in this rather uh, intimidating uh, introduction to the uh, work of prayer comes uh, from um, somewhere from the Holy Mountain where uh, a uh, a pilgrim is talking to an abbot, and the abbot is trying to impress upon him um, the, the, the change that will happen if we begin to, to, pray, to pray the Jesus prayer. And basically, he says this. He says, if we devote an hour a day to the Jesus prayer, if we were to say the Jesus prayer, for an hour a day, every day, in six months, our entire life would be transformed. Every aspect of our life, every relationship, every everything about our life would 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 be we, we'd see it in a completely different way. We'd experience our our life. Um, in, a, in a completely renewed way if we were to give ourselves to the Jesus prayer for an hour a day. So let's, let's continue. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm only going to read you a very small portion of, of this work. But I, I want to start with the introduction because the introduction kind of sets the context and the stage. Um, there are there are three works, as I said, that are attributed to Saint John Chrysostom about the Jesus Prayer, and in reality, we see that that they aren't necessarily three separate works that he's written, but they just have kind of um, come to us now, so that. Um, they, they at least they seem to be two separate, two separate things, even if they might have come from the same source. 
The Philokalia, published in Venice in 1782, is the most important work ever produced by, if not actually on, Mount Athos. An extensive collection of Orthodox Christian spiritual writings, the Philokalia comprises works by nearly 40 church fathers and ecclesiastical writers from the 4th to the 15th century. It is a comprehensive library of Orthodox ascetic and spiritual writings, universally recognized as a definitive expression of Orthodox spirituality, with special emphasis on the practice of the Jesus prayer, also known as the prayer of the heart. Kardiyaki Prosivki, or the prayer of the mind, Noara Prosivki. A mere 11 years after its publication, the Philokalia was translated into Slavonic in Moscow in the year 1793, followed by two Russian translations beginning in 1877, and today is available in virtually all European languages as well as in Japanese, Korean, Malayalam, uh, Malayalam, rather, in other foreign languages and versions. Though the Philokalia was published in the 18th century, it is not a product of early modern Orthodox piety. The collection has its roots in the late Byzantine period, 1261 to 1453, when Byzantine Hesychus compiled anthologies of works on spirituality, ascetic practice, and the Jesus prayer. In other words, the Philokalia wasn't it, like its own book, the way that we speak about the Philokalia today from very early on. It's a collection from writings that started in the fourth century, but go all the way up into the, into the um, 1400s. Many of these anthologies survive in manuscripts housed in libraries on Manathos, such as the Great Lava, Vatopedi, and Karakalu. Their contents are varied, but they all contain a common core of material that is found in the Philokalia. These collections have various titles, such as Paterikon or Asketikon, uh, in other words, a collection of patristic or ascetical texts, and in some cases, Philokalia, a word which originally meant anthology. As a result, modern scholars referred to these earlier collections as pre philokalic collections and describe them as Philokalias before the Philokalia. Some scholars believe that the Philokalia, published in 1782, was simply a printed version of a late Byzantine collection that has either not yet been found, or which has been lost or destroyed. I'm going somewhere with all of this, so just, just hang, in, hang in there with me as I talk about the Philokalia. <clears throat> but it is likely, just as likely, that the two 18th century editors of the Philokalia, St. Makarios of Corinth and St. Nicodemus, made their own choices when selecting certain extracts and works from these older collections. For the Philokalia, St. Nicodemus wrote an introduction or prologue, the relative brevity of which is in marked contrast to the significance of its contents. <clears throat> it is therefore to be regretted It is therefore to be regretted that the translation of the English Philokalia chose not to include St. Nicodemus's introduction. The absence of this introduction has created unnecessary confusion among English-speaking readers concerning the nature of the Philokalia and has effectively obscured the book's meaning and purpose. For St. Nicodemus, the Philokalia is a book about the Jesus prayer. His introduction begins with a summary account of mankind's creation, fall, loss of grace, redemption in Christ, and restoration of grace through the sacrament of baptism. He laments that the grace of the Holy Spirit given in baptism can so quickly and easily be buried and darkened by worldly cares. In response to this predicament, God provided the church with the, quote, way to find grace again a way which is truly wondrous. And this is the way of the Jesus prayer, which is, quote, ceaseless prayer to our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As a gift from God, the Jesus prayer is the divinely sanctioned way to enter the heart and recover the gift of grace given to us in baptism, which is why the Lord says, quote, the kingdom of God is within you, Luke 17, 21. For Saint Nicodemus, the Jesus prayer 
is the, quote, instrument of deification. And the philokalia is the, quote, mystical school of the prayer of the heart. He therefore rejects the notion that the practice of the Jesus prayer is only for monks and nuns, and instead teaches that it should be practiced by, quote, all the faithful who are called to pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. He believes that the failure of the faithful to practice this prayer has deprived them of sanctification and robbed the world of saints. So a pretty, a pretty, um, uh, what's the word? Um, impressive, and it, it really grabs your attention in introduction to, you know, should we be reading the Philokalia? Should we be, should we be learning about the Jesus prayer? It seems it's absolutely necessary. Um, so then he goes on to talk about St. John Chrysostom and the Philokalia and how certain of the writers in the Philokalia quote um, works attributed to St. John Chrysostom as kind of um, definitive and, and, and even, um, even uh, before the council uh, that was held um, defending the practice of the Hesychists in, in contemplative noetic prayer uh, um, that St. Gregory Palamas um, participated in and, and what, he, what he wrote quotes and says that one of these works was, was one, of the, one of these foundational works was a work by, a, a work by St. John Chrysostom. So this book contains basically um, that, uh, the, a translation of that text and work. And it's it is basically Saint John giving a certain abbot who had asked him to send him a rule of spiritual teaching for his own benefit and for the brothers that were with him. Um, so he doesn't start with talking about the Jesus prayer. Actually, he, he doesn't get to the Jesus prayer until the seventeenth paragraph of this writing which in the end only has about um, 28 paragraphs. So it, it's, it's like over halfway before he really begins to talk about prayer in essence. But I actually want to start with just a little bit of the beginning because you see what St. John Chrysostom is really talking about is what we were talking about last time, that we first need to be striving to just live the spiritual life, right? And... And um, that means, uh, let me see, he's got some subheadings here. That means we need to uh, first understand what it means to have a rule of prayer, what it means and, and how to and how read scripture and incorporate scripture into that rule of prayer. We need to understand what it means to cultivate an inner life. Um, and also at the same time to be living a life in community and and how living in that community is so essential for us to then enter into the heart. And then he finally gets to, in, in the 17th, he calls it chapter, but it's it's more like paragraph, what, when he, what he has to say about the Jesus prayer. So I'm just going to jump then. Oh, no, I said I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the first couple of paragraphs so you get a little sense of that. And then we'll jump to this, this, the 17th paragraph. This is St. John Chrysostom speaking to this certain abbot. Since you have written to me, most beloved brother, asking that I provide you with an ascetic rule, I find myself at a loss as to what I should write to you. Whoever Christ Jesus, the Lord of glory, is able to be your guide. If, indeed, you genuinely offer yourself together with the brothers to the Lord your, your God, and if, indeed, you desire to be ascetically divested of fatherland, race, possessions, and of the whole world altogether, for he who does not renounce all of his possessions and who does not die to the whole world cannot be a disciple of the Lord. And if you love the Lord your God with all your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. And if you preserve virginity immaculately in body and soul until the end. And if each one of you acquires mercy and compassion 
in the vessels of your heart, preparing yourself with bright lamps to meet the heavenly bridegroom, so that at the critical hour, the lamp of each one will not be extinguished for lack of oil. For what will it profit a man to preserve his pure body if what lies before the surface, that is, in the heart, remains full of hatred, evil, resentment, anger, jealousy, envy, and pride? For he who is even angry at his brother is still walking in the darkness and is considered by Scripture to be a murderer. So remember that St. John Chrysostom is talking to an abbot of a monastery, and he's talking about to these monks who have left everything to acquire their salvation, to, to live a life in repentance, a life of the purification of the heart. But it, all of this still applies to us in the world, right? Number two, if anyone should imagine that what I am writing is inappropriate, let him consider the parable of the ten virgins. The five were called prudent, but sacred scripture called the other five foolish, not harlots, as their bodily virginity was of no benefit to them. For instead of mercy for brother or sister, their heart was filled with poison and wickedness. And for this reason, they were cast out of that heavenly and ineffable bridegroom, as they cried out, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But they received no further benefit from the Lord of glory and were only able to hear their rejection from the Lord. I do not know you. For there is no confession or repentance after death, but only inescapable torment. Now is the time for petition. And now is the time to be freed from evil things. For whatever burden each person binds upon himself in this life is what he will carry with him into the next. I beseech you, therefore, my children and brothers, submit yourselves to the Lord and to each other in fear of Christ. And each one of you should first honor his brother, for he who glorifies his brother glorifies Jesus, and he who dishonors his brother rejects the Lord, who said, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So he goes on, you know, for these many paragraphs. That's just the end of paragraph three, telling them to submit to their leader, telling them not to, to argue in any way, telling them to acquire the virtues of obedience, telling them to, um, to cultivate ultimately love as the summation of all of, all of the rest of the virtues and, and how necessary it is to, to forgive one, to forgive each other. And how to cultivate a disposition um, where you're 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 just thinking of your brother, um, and even if your brother sins against you, you know how you you how necessary it is that you need him and you can't ac accomplish anything in the spiritual life apart from him. And to love him, the humility of the Lord, and to be merciful to each other, and to use force against yourself against your passions within yourself because then the gate is narrow and to flee from a spirit of vanity and seeking the approval of men. And he says, don't become chatterers and idle talkers or slanderers. And he says, don't be preoccupied with so-called wise men who undertake much reading but provide nothing useful. And he goes on to, to, um, to beseech them not to prefer anything beside the Lord. And, you know, for what profit is it a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? So all of that, right, he says, we have to concern ourselves with first living the commandments as best we can if we're then going to know how to pray and how to be successful in prayer. So now we get to chapter 17. St. John Chrysostom. Pray ceaselessly without anger and wandering thoughts. For every thought separating the mind from God, for every thought separating the mind from God, even if it appears to be a good thought, is entirely devilish. That I may not say that it is in fact from the devil himself. For solely to cause the mind to wander away from God, the devil will dictate within the heart of man commandments and other good works, as well as certain rational and irrational fantasies, which we must never pay any attention to as worthy of our consideration. 
So what's the first thing that St. John Chrysostom is saying when we go to pray? Is to, to not to be distracted, even by good thought, right? Now, that's different than what I was saying last week. When I say that when we begin to pray, it's as if we can see ourselves more clearly and we become more, more aware of what, what conditions in our heart, what's, what's been troubling us from the night before. Um, we become more aware of things that we said or we did that we regret. All of those, it's, it's good and it's appropriate to stop, to pray about them and to, to return to the prayer, to enter into the prayer. But he's, he's showing how that when you, in earnest, you give yourself the saying, the Jesus prayer, it's still possible, you know, that the, the temptation is, is to be distracted, is to, in some way, to have the mind um, lead us through, through these thoughts that he, he, he wants to say, in some sense, um, we can think of as coming from the devil themselves, so that we don't um, undertake to, to, to be freed of every other care except the care to be present, uh, to keep the, the mind on focused on God. The entire struggle of the devil, he says, is to separate and distract the mind from God and to mislead man into worldly pleasures. And the entire struggle of the soul is to see that the mind is not separated from God, nor attach itself to or agree with the impure thoughts, nor should the soul pay any attention to images inscribed in the heart by the devil, who is an old painter and an imitator of all things, sometimes in images, sometimes in moods, and sometimes in persons and figures. What's he describing? He's describing what happens to us most of the time, you know? He's describing how our minds, our thoughts just lead us everywhere in our imagination and, you know, and and things that that happened and things that didn't happen and that are that are we're worry we worry about or concern ourselves about the future or ruminating on things in the past or just anything of all the media that comes into our minds. All of this stuff is just it, it, it just is in the way of communicating with God. And the Jesus prayer is our way of getting rid of all of it. So that that communication becomes more, more, more um, real for us, more, more uh, truly, in, we're more truly in tune. <clears throat> After all such machinations, the devil seems transformed, and miserable man imagines himself as being elsewhere rather than where in where in fact he is, and thus deceived. He imagines seeing things and communing with persons and being in command over circumstances that are all deception of the devil. It is therefore necessary that we securely bridle and guide the mind and reprove every thought and every activity through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who takes away the sin of the world. For where the body is, there also must be the mind, so that between God and the heart, there will be no other thing such as a separating wall or obstacle, which would darken the heart and prevent it from speaking to the Lord alone. Whenever the mind becomes distracted, it must never linger in such thoughts, lest our assent to them be accounted as an actual deed before the Lord on the day of judgment, when God will judge the hidden things of man, and when the inward thought of man shall confess itself to him. It is impossible to attain the kingdom unless you first reject your own will and then do what the abbot commands without complaints and with the fear of God, as the Lord says. I did not come to do my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. If, therefore, a man suffers and patiently endures that which he does not want, it is accounted to him as a crucifixion that makes him a child of the resurrection of eternal life. So he's talking about, you know, including the, that the abbot gives them a rule of prayer and that they are, they are just to be obedient in that, as well as other things, obviously. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for in being tested by experience, he will receive the unfading crown and will become the temple of Christ, the great king. 
And then as the Lord says, I will come to dwell in him and walk with him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Therefore, having these promises, devote yourself to the Lord our God until he shows mercy and compassion on you, asking for nothing other than the mercy alone of the Lord of glory, for this will be sufficient for you. In seeking the mercy of God, seek it with a humble and broken heart. Call out then from morning until night. If possible, this is where he really gets into the main meat of the Jesus prayer. If possible, and even all night long, saying without ceasing, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Amen. I beseech you, therefore, to force yourselves again. I say to you to force your mind until death. This work requires much force, for the way is narrow and sorrowful that leads to the gate of life. And those who force their way will enter into it, for the kingdom of heaven suffers force, and those who use force take hold of it. Do not, I beseech you, do not separate yourselves from God, nor let your heart be separated from God. But remain with him and guard your heart with the memory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do this and this alone always, until such a time as the name of the Lord is planted firmly in your heart, and nothing else until such time as Christ is magnified in you. Uh, so... I just want to. I just want to to say. Remember that he's talking to monastics, and he's talking to people whose job it is is to is to make prayer their life's work, right? He's talking to them to those who who are trying to cultivate in in their time alone with God uh, a true union with God, and. Um, you know, I, I I don't want in reading these words from Saint John uh, Chrysostom or attributed to Saint John Chrysostom to to then discourage us because that seems you know impossible for us in the world. <laughs> that seems so so kind of divorced from from our life, but but rather for us to understand that uh, this work of, of learning to pray the, the Jesus prayer is, is going to be perhaps the most important thing that we learn to do, given everything else that we must do in our lives. You know, our taking care of our spouses, taking care of our families, doing our jobs, taking care of our homes, whatever else it is. That needs to get done. Um, we need to prioritize this. We need to prioritize, even if our prayer rule is only 15, 20 minutes a day. That 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 not to not to um, let anything come before that. Um, and as we as we learn how to be more fully in God's presence. Your thoughts. There's more, but I don't want to read any more. I think I read a lot already. Angela? Angela Ferreira, are you there? Oh, Margaret raised her hand. We'll go to Margaret first. Thank you, Father. <clears throat> now, this, this question might be rather elementary. I mean, I know what a rule of prayer is, but should, should we, I know, and they say that you should have your spiritual father guide you with what your rule of prayer is, but is there like a generic rule of prayer other than, you know, the Josiah prayer and the Lord's prayer? And, I mean, what, I, I'm, I mean, where do you where do you start? Where do you stop? I'm just confused about 
the constant reference to your rule of prayer and what it really should be if it okay times yeah. your life or whatever. Yeah. So let's talk <laughs> about that a little bit. Uh, the word rule in Greek is kanona prosephtis, right? When we hear it in English, a rule is a it seems like a pretty harsh thing, you know, a, a pretty un unwielding, unbending kind of thing. And it often is reminds us of like law, you know, like you have to do this or else. There's going to be consequences. There's going to be punishment, right? But in Greek, kanona means more like um, like ruler than rule. It's a measurement. It's a standard. It's something to shoot for, right? When we talk about kanona uh, prosif kis, a, a, a canon of prayer, it's not unlike... When we when we do the services and we read canons in the service, like there's the first, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth odes of a canon that we read, right? So there's an order, there's there's an amount, there's a set amount. Um, when we talk about like the canonization of of saints, making making a saint, you know, um, the, the taking someone who's lived a holy life and proclaiming claiming him as a saint. It's called canonization, which literally means just in, in the schedule of the whole year, where do we fit them in? You know, which day do we place them in so that we remember them on that day, right? So it, it has more to do with a measurement. It has more to do with, with the standard. A rule of prayer, my, my, uh, the, the priest that I go to for confession on Simon Opercha, Father Makarios, you know, has, has told me, Many times, you know, he's helped me to see that it, it, we should never experience our rule of prayer as a ball and chains. Like, oh, oh, I have to do this, right? We should, we should understand that Peter, I'm sorry, it keeps going in that. I don't know what else to tell you. It's okay. Okay. Um, we, we, um, we should understand a rule of prayer as um, the opportunity that we have each day to, to um, give that portion of the day completely undistractedly without any other, other um, anything else hindering it just to God, to be in God's presence. That's our that's our that's our alone time with God, right? That's going into the closet. So that's the rule of prayer. Means we have a, a set standard amount of, cer of um, certain types or means of being in God's presence. We can be reading the prayers of the church. We can be reading the Psalms. We can be reading Scripture or other holy writings. We can be saying the pre Jesus prayer or some other type of um, uh, um, simple, repeated um, expressions that we folk that help us to focus ourselves more completely on God's presence. We can be saying hymns to the saints and to the Mother of God, saying prayers of intercession for other people. All of that makes up a rule of prayer, right? It can involve lighting candles, offering incense, uh, doing prostrations. It can it can involve, um, uh, you know, any of the things I said, or all of the things that I said, or just just a little bit of some, or a little bit of of the other. What you said in the beginning, Margaret, is, you know, it, the 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 key to a rule of prayer is to having. A spiritual guy is to having a spiritual father who knows us and with us comes up with where we're going to start. You know, we don't start with something. If we've never had a rule of prayer before, you don't start in an hour long prayer. My first prayer rule I said a couple of weeks ago was five minutes. It was, it was five minutes long. Um, we just start somewhere, and if we're praying it 
if we're if we're giving ourselves over to that prayer consistently, persistently, what we begin to see happens is our desire to pray more grows within us. And then with our spiritual father, we begin to add things to it. And then the rule of prayer becomes a little bit more like, let's say, the minimum of what we might do, right? We're going to at least do this much in a day, but we have a blessing now to, if our heart desires to spend a little bit more time in one or other of those um, many uh, types or, or forms of, of, of being in God's presence, you know, um, parts of, of what make up a prayer rule. Uh, some people love the Psalms, you know, and some people spend a great deal of their prayer rule in the reading of, of the Psalms or even the, the singing of the Psalms or reciting, reciting the Psalms. You know, this is a, it, most everything that we do when we're alone is just taken from what we do when we're all together in church. You know, the, even the prayers that we pray in, in our personal prayer books basically come from the services of the church. So it's, it's by extension, our personal prayer rule is never of something that is private or how should I, how should I put this? We're never, we never stop being members of the church. And so, um, the, our experience of the corporate worship informs our prayer rule and our person, our prayer rule, or our time alone in the, in the, into your closet and pray to your closet who sees in secret, prepares us for to 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 desire more fully and be more attentive and to get more out of the corporate worship experience. So, I guess, Margaret, what I'm trying to say in all of that is. You know, you and I have have begun to talk about this, and we'll keep talking about it. And we'll we'll keep, um, you know, giving it a little more nuance. And you know, as we talk more, and you say, "Well, this seems to re I really like this. I don't get so much out of this," and and we find what works for you. Does that help? Thank you, thank you, Father. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Anyone else about those words from St. John Chrysostom? Mm. Father, it's me. It's I saw uh -huh. You and I have had talks about this too. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I think or I have to share this dream. Father, you know, I'm, I think you know what dream I'm going to talk about. It, it happened on the Feast of St. Marina. And I do admire St. Marina. I think she's a very... Um, I have a lot of respect for her because she's she's got moxie. I <laughs> think to put it to, <laughs> she's got spunk, and I like that. Um, but at any rate, um, I'm going to just shorten this. I was in the dream confronted with entities that were not of this world, and I knew it. And um, I heard elders singing in the background, and I could see the image in my head of these elders and. I thought, okay, the Jesus prayer, the Jesus prayer, I need to pray the Jesus prayer. And I started to recite the Jesus prayer. And at that point, I could feel myself like going, like flying, almost like Superman at the speed of light. It was just incredible. Um, and I happened to see my son that night too, as well. Healthy, happy, I was playing soccer. <laughs> he disappeared you know i heard his voice and he disappeared this was right before um you know i started i had after patrick disappeared these entities were coming at me evil entities and i heard saw the elders and my mind they were singing and then it reminded me to pray the jesus prayer pray the jesus prayer and it was like whew, nothing could touch me <sighs> I guess what concerns me is what you said about thoughts when you're praying the Jesus prayer, like what is of God and what is not of God. I mean, that was really. So 
I, I guess my question is how to like, I, I guess St. John Chrysostom answered it. Just stay focused. If you, if, if even good thoughts come to mind. Um, Cause I think at one time I did pray and I thought I kind of like saw an image of my son and I thought I heard his voice. Right. So, right. you know, I, I want in, to be able to in, discern between God and the evil one and of course crush the evil right. one, get rid of him. Right. And that's the one thing. And the second thing is um getting to that place of peace because I have prayed this and there's times when I'm praying and I remember reading it. I don't remember which saint said it. Um if you feel um I started uh feeling like very light. It was like a feeling coming from my heart going upward. I call it the rising in my brain. I call it the rising. Like I was rising up, rising up, rising up. But then you hit this place, which I call it breaking the barrier. And then you feel this, this incredible peace. I think the incredible peace is where God is. The rising is getting to him. I, I don't know. I hope I make, I'm making sense to you, father. Um, so it is making sense. Um, and in in what you're what you're doing is you're kind of describing in a subjective way how you experience this time that you're praying, right? And and what I want to say to you right now in the context of of all of us together is that um we don't pray for spiritual experiences, right? We don't, we, we're, our goal is not to have euphoric experiences. Our goal in prayer is very simply to, to keep ourselves aware of God's presence. And um, as, as um, uh, elder, um, Father Epiphanius Theodoropoulos said, he said, when he was asked, have you ever seen visions? And he said, thanks be to God, no. And I never want to see them. I just want to see my sins. That in, in our time of prayer, what we're hoping is, and I'm actually just going to start reading about it right now in this book, The Friend of God. So we're hoping to know ourselves more clearly, right? That God will reveal to us more fully what truly is within our own hearts. And paradoxically, what happens is that ha as he reveals that more fully to us, two things that seem um, almost irreconcilable happen at the same time. One is we become more aware of his love and his peace and his truth and some of these things that you were describing that you had in that experience. And at the same time, that light from God shows us more fully our own sins. And we become more aware of how far we are from his love. As we experience his love, at the same time, we become more aware of our unworthiness of it because we don't love anything like he loves. You know, we, we become, he, the spiritual life is not so much that we begin to have these uh, um, these um, elevated spiritual experiences uh, of of heaven on earth. You know, the third, it's not that St. Paul wasn't taken up to the third heaven, right? But ultimately, you know, the, the goal was, and the goal is, is repentance. So, so that um, even in the midst of those experiences, the, the person praying, uh, remains in a state of of aware, uh, humility, really, but the humility in the sense of awareness of our of our unworthiness and um, of our our that compared to God, you know, um, what what it, all, all of our Whatever we do is nothing. There's nothing really. That, that's that's what kind of comes to us, is that 
everything good is from him. And, and, and it's only because of his mercy that we, what, whatever we do, we, we do. And it's only because of his, of his mercy that he, he allows us to, um, to continue. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm trying to find the, the right way to express this, but it's that, you know, we, we cultivate this, this gratitude because we become more aware um, you know, it's like it's like Saint Sisoy in the desert. You know, he was having these experiences at the end of his life, and he was telling the the angels who came to take his soul, "No, no, no, give me more time." And and the, all the monks around asked him, "What are you What are you asking for more time? You've been in the desert repenting more than the rest of us." And he said, "My brothers, I don't know if I've even begun to repent yet." You know, um, so. I think, I think what I'm trying to say is, is that in our in our practice of the Jesus Prayer, it's it's the cultivate cultivation within ourselves of the of a contrite heart and of tears to that wash our hearts. That is. Um, not not manufactured tears, but tears that come without us even being able to, to um, you know, and to to understand how it is that that they're coming. But the the effect of those tears is to um, bring us to that sense of God's God's greatness and His love, um, and and our. Again, like I, I'm saying, I'm repeating myself, our kind of unworthiness of it, right? Kind of lost me a little bit, Father. I'm okay. sorry. All right. What about truth? What about guidance? What about the desire to do his will? Isn't, I mean, this, you, you keep saying, don't. Yeah. Like, I'm just wondering if the piece I encountered was really him <laughs> and how to know. Well, if I'm I would sense. say, I would say you don't, you don't need to be concerned that it, that was a, a truthful experience of God or not, but, but he will reveal that to you as you continue to focus on loving as he loved as you continue to just say the prayer, as you continue to trudge each day in in trust and faith in Him, right? Um, I wouldn't doubt the peace that entered your heart, but I I I would caution, or I'm cautioning everyone in listening to this, is that our goal is that's not what. It may be something that comes when we pray, but it's not what is our goal in pray. Right? The goal is in in being brought into the presence of God. Is is we understand His humility. We understand His His um His forbearance and and His. Um, you know, he is, he is with us, whether we understand that or not, and whether we experience him um, or not, we, 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 we learn to trust in the circumstance of our life and that he's working in those circumstances. So what I'm hearing, if I'm correct, it's not it's not wrong to us, you know, to follow his will or to, you know, get guidance or 
or or truth from him. That's not it, those aren't bad things. But the ultimate be, goal, you're saying to be to be asking for truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but it but the asking for truth is um, um Lord help me to see myself. Help me to see the world as it is it truly is. Help me to understand you. You know, as the truth, as as the way and the truth and the life. Let me let me start reading from this next chapter, from the book, "The Friend of God: An Illustrated Manual on Jesus Prayer," and maybe this will this will help a little bit in to, in where I'm, what I'm trying to say. Um, so uh, we're jumping in this book now. Up to all the way up to stage five. If you remember, I had mentioned last time that uh, Father Daniel, who originally when I asked him said he would join us tonight, but then he thought about it some more and he he wrote me back and he said, Father, I don't, I'm not a, a person who should speak about the Jesus prayer. And I said, Father Dan, if you listen to the first three sessions, you would know that neither am I. I should be, you know, what, what, why do I think I can even speak about these things? But um, I appreciated that he said he begged off from being coming on tonight. But I still wanted to share a little bit more of what he wrote himself and then what he wrote, the quotes that he had from, from contemporary elders and fathers. So he's talking about stage five. Stage one is just the decision to pray and seek God. Stage two is the resolve which in, involves bodily purity um, and something he calls FCA. Stage three is um, he speaks about postures, gestures, time and space, like the when and the how to begin to pray. Stage four is breath, pulse, walking with prayer. And that's the beginning to uh, cultivate this rhythm of prayer. So now stage five, that's what I'm reading from, is this control of sense distractions. Crucify the senses, know thyself. This step consists of the awareness and then control of the three powers of your soul and the withdrawal of the senses, emotions, and the mind from attractive objects and thoughts. Logis me. Stop the insane passions. Stop the crazed emotions. Stop the destructive inner thoughts. Get a hold and control of yourself. Not narcissism, nor self-loathing. A spiritual Sabbath. Leaving it all behind to get it all, to get God. So then he says, a true freedom from all negativity and even positive attachments. It is the journey of kenosis. Emptying yourself to find yourself. It is a cleansing of your your five senses or a control over them to save them in action properly and in order in their own place and thus for them not to control you. It is a cleansing of your emotions or a control over them to see them, oh, I'm sorry, in, in their own place and thus for them not to control you. It is a cleansing of your mind's thoughts or a control over them. Oh, it, it repeats the same sentence twice in here. The three powers of the soul and the task ahead. Number one, put off the cravings of the stomach and abdomen, of food, of sex, etc. Number two, don't trust the emotions of the heart, anger, hate, even joy at first. Number three, zap away and don't pay attention to the thoughts in the mind. Any idea, imagining, fantasy, or thoughts on things to do, even good or grand ideas. And then he goes into more kind of uh, depth about these things. Remember, we are looking for God who is in us but is not of us. Divinity is beyond all sense and emotional and mental reactions. Be still and know that I am God. 
God says. This means to still or silence all of your, quote, self, your cravings, your emotions, your thoughts, and thus to be in a state of sobriety, nipsis, and attention, prosuhi, in order to be with God. Listen. This is a complete overhaul and transformation of all passions of the soul and body. This stage is ascetical and active. It is also called the path of action, or in Greek, praktiki, or catharsis, purification, or ithiki, ethics, or morals. Getting close to God by doing or practicing. It's the Martha personality. Just do it, is the motto. With no immediate concern for analyzing, worshiping, or even meditation, but rather to simply kill or transform our passions by the spiritual medicine of fasting, doing good to others, willingness to be humiliated, among other practices, not by talking, thinking, or meditating. Deadening the ego is the art of crucifying all the sense appetites and impulses, emotions, and all of our thoughts, images, fantasies, and imaginings, even good ideas and thoughts too. And then he writes, remember, even if we sit in the remotest place, our mind will still wander off to conjure up images and be active. The best thing is not to stop acting, but to do something to stop the thoughts and hence to still and cleanse the mind. In fact, to transfer all that is human in order to become authentically human once again. We must begin to develop a sense of active detachment in the midst of all activities. By following this practice of non-attachment to everything of our soul and body, we get closer to our true self. Truly, truly know thyself. And of course, come into a sober state to unite with God. We begin to, this is all in capital letters, we begin to become passionless, the ongoing goal of this stage in our entire life. So apathia, passionlessness, right, is best understood as not, not having any, any emotions or any feelings or any, any desires. It's rather that we cultivate our desire for God, which becomes stronger than our desire for anything else. So then he goes on to say, listen to the teaching of the spiritual fathers and the three powers of the soul in their natural state, functioning properly and in harmony. Um, <clears throat> and then um, after about two pages of quotes from the spiritual fathers, he goes on to say, listen to the teachings of the spiritual fathers on the relationship of the body to the soul, their mutual influence as well as the governance of the soul over the body. And then another couple pages. Listen to the teaching of the spiritual fathers on the false negative effect on the three powers of the soul and the five senses of the body, resulting in their total dysfunction and disharmony. He has pictures that kind of elevate all these things, illustrate all, all of these things. And then finally... He says, now listen to the teaching of the spiritual fathers on how to heal the whole human being, starting with the guarding of the outer five senses of the body, and then the control and cure of the appetites and emotions, and finally the inner cleansing of, of the noose. So there's a lot, there's an awful lot in this chapter, and we're not gonna we're not going to cover it all. But I just wanted to read a couple of these very first um, things on the powers of the soul. St. Anthony the Great. One who knows thyself knows God. And one who knows God is worthy to worship him as his right. Therefore, my beloved in the Lord, know thyself. Bishop Athanasius Yatich. Attention, prosoki, my beloved, is very important in human life. Saint Basil corrected and fulfilled Greek wisdom. At Delphi, there was an inscription allegedly by the prophetess Pythia stating, Know thyself, 
Gnothi Seftom. Socrates and the disciples like to repeat this. But Basil says in one, says in one of his homilies that a human being is not simply to know thyself, but is to be attentive to thyself. This is from his homilies on Genesis, when God tells Lot to leave Sodom and in so doing to be attentive to himself. Instead of know thyself, Father Basil, Father Basil the Great says, be attentive to thyself, which is the fulfillment of know thyself. St. Theodore the Great has said, For every deiform soul is tripartite, according to St. Gregory the Theologian. Virtue, when established in the mental power, excludes wisdom, discretion, and understanding. Virtue, when established in the emotional power, exudes courage and patience. Virtue, when established in the appetitive power, exudes moderation, self-restraint, and self-control. Then justice or righteousness, the Kyosini, penetrates all three powers of the soul, enabling them to function in harmony. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to hold up the book to, to give you a, um, <clears throat> a couple of pictures that you can see in the, bo in the book here. And so you see the top picture and it shows the brain. This is what it says. The brain houses the mind, nous in Greek, the highest power of which when cleansed grants each person wisdom and the ability to know God. It is where the image of God resides when nestled in the core of every person in the spiritual heart. Right? And then he has the picture of the heart. The heart, car, car, cardia in Greek, houses the emotions and when orderly grants each person courage and zeal against evil and injustice and, endure, and to endure afflictions. <clears throat> and then the, the final one at the bottom, the abdominal organs, especially the stomach, house the appetites. And when healthy, grants each person moderation and fervor to carry out God's commandments. So then what I just read, he has kind of illustrated in this picture here, where it says, the mental powers of the soul, agape love, unconditional, and the virtue of wisdom. The emotional power of the soul, filial love, friendship, and the virtue of courage. And the appetitive power of the soul, erotic love, and the virtue of moderation. So this idea, uh, this understanding is, if I can sum all of the, everything that I read up, is that um, these powers of the soul manifest in our physical body all need purification. That our, our desires, that our, um, our <clears throat> um, it, so there's the, there's the, the physical um, the appetitive powers of the soul is that like the uh, the is cor corresponds with the appetites of of the body, while the emotional, which is um, and I'm trying to think of the words in the Greek. Um, we are intellective. Uh, we're desiring, and we're, what's the third one, Stevie? I'm blanking right now. Is it energetic? Energetic, yeah. That's that's what I was trying to be thinking of. So that's where the emotional comes from, energetiki. So all three of these powers of the soul, in when we say the Jesus prayer, they... Um, come to um, come to a place where they're more rightly ordered, right? So if you think about saying the Jesus prayer, like even the posture of the Jesus prayer, right? The the posture tends to be where we kind of bring them a little bit more together, right? 
but we're not, we are not, um, we're, we're, we're not, um, how can I, how can I put this? We're not being controlled by them, but would rather um, now, as we're saying the prayer, we're, we're becoming more aware of them. And so as, as we're praying, we become more, more aware of what our desires are, um, you know, in terms of um, what, what also um, our feelings are in in kind of what we want and what our what our thoughts are and and how we are perceiving perceiving um things in our life right and in, in our experience of being in the body the jesus prayer is not leaving the body the jesus prayer is rather entering more fully within ourselves to become to know what's happening you know what's happening in 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 all of us and and um the paradox is that that happens not by you know like when when you they say when we begin meditation we begin to like become more aware breathing in and out of just feeling our body how how do how do the muscles feel our heart rate what are, what are our emotions at that time? Even like, what are the thoughts that we may be having at that time? And in focusing on, on, our, on our breathing, becoming more aware of all of these things, in, in saying the Jesus prayer, it's as if, um, it, we, it's not that we, we no longer continue to feel or think or desire, but that all of that becomes um, how can I say redirected towards the source of of true wisdom and uh, the all 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 that is good that we can know and feel and and the ultimate source of of our um, our desire is intimacy and union with God. So I don't know if I'm making any sense to everybody to anybody. I'm 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 trying to do a lot of uh, pulling it all together. And I I can just say that when I say the Jesus prayer, that um when I read these things, it helps me to understand when I'm saying the Jesus prayer, my you know what what is happening. Um, as I keep myself just focused on on the words of the prayer and on the Lord's presence. Well, what I get from this father is that uh, uh, some of us, though we may try, some of us will be more successful in achieving the objective of the of the Jesus prayer. But yet we should continue to strive for it, to find that inner self. The, the problem I keep having is I don't, and, and someone else who spoke about, I think was referring to this, is that I don't know whether I'm actually connecting with God. Am I just connecting with Peter? And uh, is it God within me or is it just me, earthly Peter, trying to understand earthly Peter? Uh, there are a few times I feel connected when I pray. It's a fleeting moment, but I don't know who or what I was connecting with. Yeah. Elder Emilinos talks about this a little bit in his homily on prayer, where it says, at first, when we're praying, it's kind of like we're just calling out to God. He said the way that, you know, he might like be on 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 one of the one of the peaks of of Mount Athos, and he looks across the valley and he sees on another outgrowth of land 
you know, uh, one of the other monks, and he says, Father Theoktistos, and he like calls out to him. He says, prayer in the beginning, we 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 sense this this distance, right, from God. Um, uh, when I cry out to God, um, let me see if I can find the place. That, that's that's kind of more in the beginning, where with the subjective kind of experience. Then, um, let me. I can find it. If I can find it, I want. I just want to give you a, a taste of how he writes about it. Um, okay. Now I have this immediate feeling of a dialogue, although not yet a dialogue as such, but rather a cry. For to the extent that I am still wrestling or have not won, God is far away. I'm down here and God is up there in the heavens. I am incorruptible and he is incorruptible. I am earth and he's the purest air. He is something heavenly. He is something different. How then can I be united to him and speak to him? And that's why I cry out. For example, when I'm trying to find someone and I can't see where he is, I go out onto the balcony and shout, Father Theoktistos. And if he's around, he'll answer. And if I hear him, then I'll start talking to him. We're still in the place where we don't see God. We don't hear God. We don't understand God. We don't know God. We live in total ignorance and what is essentially complete oblivion. I neither remember God nor know him. That is why I cry out to him all the time so that he will take pity on me and answer me. And when God answers me, then I can strike up a conversation. That is how prayer begins. At this stage, we are undergoing experiences, which, as we said, are a prelude to prayer. Now, now I'm going to go to the end when he talks about you know, how we, we get to this final like encounter with God. So now the Spirit begins to reveal himself to me himself to cry Abba Father that is he reveals to us his identity with the Father moreover the Son is also acting in the Holy Spirit who moves within the church bearing witness to the Father now you can interpret all the passages of scripture which describe these movements of the Holy Trinity the economical movements of the Trinity in our lives so the Holy Trinity begins mystically to reveal to us the Father his identity with the Father and now we have a feeling for the Son who is joined to us and who comes to us, the coming Christ. And at once we undergo another new kind of experience of which until now we were ignorant. What is this experience? The experience of a new spiritual anguish. When you're in the dark and it feels as if some shadow falls across you, you spring back, don't you? And you wonder, what is it? When you hear a sudden noise, you want to know what it is because you are bewildered. It's like that. You hear the voice of God. You feel his presence. You are taken by surprise. You are startled by it and you worry. What on earth is this? God, Satan, a passion, a projection of my ego. What on earth is it? Because we're now on spiritual paths, I'll say what I have to say very briefly, very roughly, in a very broad outline. Let's put it like that, without getting into the details of any particular experience. So far, we've considered the experiences which our soul undergoes in order to get to the point of being able to pray. From that point forward, we enter into that stage of prayer, which is the quest for God. The dialogue hasn't yet begun, nor has prayer if he, and so neither has communion with God really begun. That will happen after what we say now. So now the anguish of our soul begins. It's as if my soul says, who are you? What are you that you make me afraid? I'm describing things, of course, in very rough terms. In the beginning, God hides from us, as if it were a game of hide and seek. And when you approach someone from behind and place your hands over his eyes and say, guess who I am? You're so-and-so. No, I say. Then you must be what's his name? Wrong again. Then you're such and such. Yes, and I uncover his eyes and give him a hug. We experience something exactly like this in our soul. And in the course of our prayer, we are in anguish and God hides from us as if he were playing with us. And thus I shout to him again more loudly, why are you toying with me? 
Who are you? Tell me what you want. And in response, the Spirit will say to us, You have been calling for me all these many years, and now you ask me what I want? I begin to understand more fully what I was seeking, what I was after, why I'm alive. Sometimes we say we don't even know why we're alive. And unless God teaches us, we really don't know and can, can understand why we're alive. So who are you, we say to him later. It's me, God. So you are my God? I am. Don't you recognize me? It is I who brought you into the world, who baptized you, who tonsured you a monk, who answered you when you prayed. And when you were saying, my God, my God, it was I who helped you. But you didn't recognize me because you really weren't seeking me at all. It was I who was hiding behind your hunger, behind your thirst, behind your sleep, behind your kneeling, behind all your successes and all your sins. It was I who was behind everything. Anyways, Peter, that that's what you were saying kind of reminded me of these words of Yenende Milimas. As we pray, um, uh, God teaches us, and we just keep praying. And and in that process, we we um, we 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 come because He begins to um, to to draw closer to us. We come to a greater awareness of what it is that we're really even doing, right? And who who he truly is and who we are in relation to him. And all I can say is that that becomes it's transformative. That becomes that renews us. Um, and reprioritizes us and re redirects us and reorients us. Until until we're before him. <laughs> it's just what we do. Yeah. Right to right to right to the last day of this life. We're gonna be praying the moment that we're dying, you know. And then we will no longer see in the mirror dimly. We'll see face to face. You know, you, you read you read, you read uh, about uh, Father John Chrysostom and the letter that he wrote to monk to a monk or monks. I'm not sure mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. about how to pray. And um, if you read one of his prayers, it, it I, I, I read it as a pre-communion prayer. is one of the most self-deprecating prayer I have ever read. So, so he was struggling. Yeah. <laughs> And and we learn that it's it's not to to pray that way is already to be become more fully aware of how far we are from God. Like that's that shows like spiritual progress, not not a not a, a masochistic, you know, no, it wasn't no. negative attitude about yourself, but a more uh, a, a closer awareness of our true spiritual state. You know, I'm always telling people in confession, the more we confess, the better we get at it, the more we're going to have to confess. You know, the Holy Spirit is continuously making us more aware of how far we are from him, but it, but not without also understanding how, how great his love for us is so that, uh, you know, we, it, it's limitless. So that he's, we can still trust in him and hope in him. Sure. Stevie, <laughs> you want to share with us what that look means on your face? Oh, sorry, I didn't know that I had a look. <laughs> well, what, I want to know what you're what you're thinking at that moment. Um. Well, I was thinking that 
uh, this is all too high for me. And maybe can you talk a little bit about the idea that came up of like keeping the commandments as a preparation for the other stuff? <laughs> Um, so, right, we, uh, in order to, to approach Holy Scripture and understand more, full, more fully the words of Holy Scripture, we try to practice what we already understand or what we've already heard and know, right? And we understand that it's not, we're not trying to, to like fill a quota. We're not trying to impress God. We're not trying to do, it's not like boxes to check off, you know. Thou shall not commit adultery, check. Thou shall not steal, check. Thou shall not bear false witness, check. It's that as we, as we strive to fulfill these commandments in our life, that Christ is hidden is in, in his commandments. So he comes to us in and through the commandments. But in this context, the one St. John Chrysostom was was enjoining the brothers what they needed to do um, to enable their prayer. It we we first um it's first the the practice, the active life, right? So if we're if we're setting aside time to pray to the Lord every day, but we're also in our lives not fixing other things, um, not, not prioritizing um, serving others, not prioritizing e eating in moderation, not prioritizing, you know, in, in the ways in that how much, how much, um, Uh, television or whatever other forms of, of um, you know, visual media that we take in, then it's going. It's not going to help our prayer in any way. Um, we need to. We need to to be practicing the. The, um, the 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 things that we when we go to confession we need to put those things into practice we need to be be striving to cultivate the virtues in our life and um It, 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 if um, if we're doing that, then we'll find when we're. But I, I think it goes two ways too. I think when we begin to pray, and even when we pray the Jesus prayer, we become more aware of everything else that we need to work on in our life as well. So it's not to say, all right, you have to get everything else down, and then. You start praying. If anything, it, it to me it almost kind of starts with prayer. It's like in prayer, I become much more aware of all the changes I need to make, and then during the day, I hope to hope to to be more attentive to them. Does that does that address at all what you were asking? Yeah, thank you. I think the point at the end you made about like, oh, I need to get all this down and then start praying is made me laugh because I mean, I always, I, we probably a lot of people do this, like you, there's this temptation to think like my prayer is not going to work because I didn't do all these things and I'm such a sinner. So now God, and then that like prevents you from even like starting to mm -hmm. pray or like you're not you're closed off to god and those are the thoughts that saint john christian was saying and what we we're reading beginning not to listen to you know 
Exactly. It seems like um, the more you focus on it, the more your intellect tries to tell you that you can't possibly accomplish any of this stuff. And it's kind of like, you know, like those um, animal balloons that, that a clown would make a, an animal out of. It's like when you focus on one piece of it and you squeeze it, the air goes somewhere else. And then you go after that bubble and it goes back to somewhere else. And it's like almost, you know, like the spitting plates, whatever, that you're trying to balance all these things. Um, and it's that issue of, is it me who has to do that or God that has to do that? And then how do you allow God to do that without getting in the way? Um, yeah, it, it, he does it kind of in spite of us, <laughs> even, even uses the things that we do wrong to then teach us and reveal to us more fully what that will is, you know? It kind of so, reminds me, it kind of reminds me of that book that we studied, um, Everywhere Present, mm -hmm. like that, the two story where God's upstairs and we're downstairs and how, you know, if we're not, I don't want to say forcibly, but if we're not attentively seeking him, then he kind of takes a back burner because other things go on, like, you know, your day-to-day -day activities. Um, and that's, I don't know, that's very challenging, I guess, which is why I feel like everything you've talked about tonight is beautiful. Um, but I'm like nowhere near any of that. <laughs> so when you're talking about deep and over our head, absolutely. <laughs> we all are. Um, well, I, I don't, I, I, what I, I don't want to do is discourage anyone. Um, so, um, Father, it's been an encouragement. All right. I'm glad to hear that, Jane. And just being more reminded to to pray and to increase with the Jesus prayer or to fit it's this in at points and being reminded. But I just from tonight, um, you said, I think it's St. John Chrysostom, where God is in us, but not of us. And that simultaneity, I know, I know I'm fighting also the whole thing, fighting even good thoughts that distract. I mean, that's a battleground and I'm glad to hear it because I'm really convicted that, you know, oh yeah, I've got to do this. And then I come back and continue praying. <laughs> this, and, and so that's something that I need to do a little bit more attentiveness, but I try to pray in the morning because it's the only time I can be alone basically that I can be sure of because I get up earlier than anyone else most days. And that's good uh, because if I'm praying, however well or not well I'm doing it, it's since I, the, we've had these studies and I've been praying the Jesus prayers I can more through the day. There's been more moments where I'll be praying and, and then it's just an awareness that, I mean, not that I, per se, since his presence, but um, like in us, but not of us, just realizing like faith is that which you, you believe in that which you don't see. And just, sorry, I'm not saying this very well, just a real realization, like you're here, aren't you? <laughs> you're right here. You, you see me and I look out and see you who made these trees and everything, every rock, and you're right here. You're listening to me and just uh, a, an awareness that he must be and, and a belief I guess it's belief I believe that he's there I you know it's not a matter that I sense or feel or experience anything but just I believe that he is and is there and he I guess a rewarder of those who diligently seek I'm not looking for reward but just it's I think that this, that simplicity has come more in my prayers this last several weeks since I've been praying the Jesus. Yeah, like you said, you've prayed the Jesus prayer, maybe you don't sense anything, but other things start changing. And I think that faith that God is and that he is with me and he, he hears me and he knows me um, is, is more present in my time of prayer. 
Yeah. Um, it, it's a journey. And um, like, the, like the monk said, if we devote ourselves to it, we will see over time the difference. Uh, and we may not even experience that at all in the time that we're actually praying. But we, we see that in, in our lives. We see that in, in our relationships with others. We see that in, in, in um, 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 how he uses us, you know, in, in ways that uh, it, providential encounters and providential experiences um, so that so that we're encouraged. I mean, he, he he if if we're praying well, uh, prayer is becoming an, a mirror in our life, and it's showing us where we need to go. But it's also showing us that he we're not. It's not something that having to do alone. That he is actually doing it. He's, he is working in our, in our lives, and yet we're, and yet paradoxically we're we're aware of how often our heart is not even wanting to cooperate and not wanting to to go along with him. But he doesn't abandon us, and so prayer becomes a a a, 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 a reminder and an encouragement that we can start again each day. And we're, we're one step closer. <laughs> we are always one step closer. All right, everybody. I hope, I hope if this was um, something that some everyone could get something out of. And if not, please forgive me and let's pray for one another and uh, and ask the Lord to to help us all to uh, to find the the right way to use the Jesus prayer in our lives and let's let's end with uh, with just saying the Jesus prayer a few times um, I, it doesn't work if we all speak at once so I think I'm going to ask someone who hasn't said anything tonight. Um, Mary Carol, are you still with us? Yes, I'm still with you. <laughs> would you Would you be willing to to just say the Jesus prayer a few times for all of us? Just take your time, and uh, we'll all listen and let it resonate within ourselves, and then uh, then I'll end us with with the short prayer. Okay. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. Have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord, we thank you for this time, for these last four sessions. We thank you for your presence among us and for the those who have gone before us and our holy fathers and saints who help us to know how to pray 
and help to call upon your name. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for the ways each day in which we forget you in your presence, in which we are, are willfully choose not to turn towards you and not to call out and not to force ourselves um, to enter into your presence in, within us. We ask that you bless us this evening and as we go forward to call out upon your name night and day, in and out of season, and to remain confident and trusting that you are with us, that you are meeting us and taking us all into your presence into your kingdom. We also pray for all those who have not been able to join us, all of our family, our loved ones, that you may include them in and through our prayer in your kingdom and, and bring, them, bring them with us all to be with you. For you are our sanctification, our enlightenment, you are the way for all of us, the truth of our lives. You are the life and the resurrection. And to you we give our praise, our thanks, our glory, our worship with your Father and your all Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Good night. Well, it's it's quite late. Thanks for hanging in there, buddy. Thank, Thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night. Thank you, Father. Good night, all. Thank you so much. Good night.